John Gaydens, congratulations on your recent Critics' Choice nomination. That must be a thrill for you. It is. It really is. Thank you. Well, what do you make of all this critical acclaim and now that you're part of the uh, crazy awards season? Um, I don't know. I, I mean, I think, you know, I've seen, I've seen most of the movies and, man, this is a really good movie year. I, mean, I, I think I've seen five or six movies that I really, really like. So, I mean, it's, it's not to be the guy, but I'm going to be the guy who's like, man, just to be in the conversation is pretty amazing. Yeah, it is pretty cool. Um, but, you know, Flight is one of very few um, smart, character-driven films made by studios these days. I mean, that's a fact. It's a few and far between because, you know, obviously the studios have a business model and um, a film like this normally would not be made. So can you talk us through how this firstly got off the ground? Yeah, I mean, it's a crazy story because I started writing the script in 1999 2000 um, and I never thought it would get made so I was kind of writing it on spec but really just writing it for me so um, you know what I went on and lived a whole life in the in between because I would pick it up and put it down and um, I got as far as you know I, I wrote and directed a movie for DreamWorks called Dreamer with Dakota Fanning and Kurt Russell which was like this horse racing story like a family story and after I finished it, DreamWorks said, well, what do you want to do next? And I showed them 40 pages of flight, and they were like, what? And I was like, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. And th at that point, it was probably 2005, and they said to me, look, this is a really tough piece of business for studios. It's an R-rated drama. And they even pointed me towards, like, see this movie Michael Clayton, and it hadn't come out yet. So when it came out, I saw it, and I was like, wow, that movie's great. And they're like, yeah, it didn't really make any money. And I was like, wow, okay. So those dramas were a really tough piece of business. And... It really took, you know, movies like The Fighter and uh, even Black Swan and a Coen Brothers movie, like movies that were more real dramas that started to bring audiences out that made studios feel like they could maybe embrace those movies again. And for Flight in particular, it really came down to Denzel Washington wanting to do the movie and Robert Zemeckis wanting to do the movie that, and, and the two of them being willing to push off their fees um, to make the movie happen. It really, that's really was, it was their passion that really made the movie go. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, you've probably d discussed this on numerous occasions, but I'm curious to know exactly how Denzel became involved and, and like, what, what was your reaction when you were told or when it's Denzel actually, was told to do it's it? It's a great story because I was sitting in the exact chair I'm sitting in right now in my little tiny office, and I've got this. I'm, see, this was so funny because the girl that you met is the girl who works with me, and she like had to set this up for me because I'm so not tech savvy. So like, let me show you my cell phone. That's my <laughs> phone. Okay. Wow, well, it's a relic. It's an yeah. old relic. This is the phone they give out, you know, at the free clinic. Do you know what I mean? Like this is, this <laughs> is really like, you know what I mean? So, uh, so I was literally sitting in this office with this little crummy phone and it rang and I looked at it and on the little screen it said unavailable and I picked it up and I was like, hello? I said, John? I said, yeah. It's like, it's Denzel. And I was like, hey. Uh, and I was like, well, it's either Denzel Washington or it's Jay Farrow from SNL. But either way, I'm going with it, man. And he was like, have dinner with me. So he and I um, had this dinner, and we talked a lot about the script. And what was really cool is that he, um, he had an agent named Ed Lamato, which was his longtime agent. And Ed had given him two scripts before he died. And um, one of them was Safe House, which Denzel was leaving to go make. And then he had Flight, and he said, I'm going to go make that movie, and when I come back, I'm going to make this movie. So I had tried to direct Flight for many years, you know, almost put it together a couple times, and then there was this moment in time where Denzel got his hand on the script and really wanted to play the part. And for all the things that had gone wrong for 10 years on this project, there was one little moment in time where things went right because Denzel said he wanted to do it, and then someone had handed it to Zemeckis, and he wanted to do it, so it's like, and, and Zemeckis loved the idea of Denzel in the part, and then Zemeckis called me and said, have lunch with me, which turned into six hours of he and I in a room, and at about hour three, he said, I need to ask you a question. Are you, are you cool with me making this movie? Because I know you've tried to direct it for, for years, and I said, I can't get it done without you. I said, so we, I need you, and he said, okay, well, come with me. He said, come to Atlanta with me and make the movie. I want to rent your brain, is what he said. I want to rent your brain, so... It was great, man. I mean, I got to be there the whole time. It was absolutely the best, like, combination of, of creative heads in the movie because I got to kind of participate in everything. 
Yeah, absolutely. And given your background, you're an actor as well. You have been for a while. Um, yeah. When, when, during the process of making the film and then after seeing it, um, how do you separate your role as the writer and also your background as the actor when you're watching and um, kind of judging how the film's turned out? Well, this movie is, is it's hard to answer that question on this movie because if you look at the cast we had, I mean, it's insane. It's like Don Cheadle and Melissa Leo, Kelly Riley, John Goodman, Bruce Greenwood. I mean, every James Badgedale, who plays the gaunt young man, the cancer patient. I mean, the, these people were giving performances that were like, we. I just kind of stood there, mouth agape, like, oh my gosh, because like they came in. Some of them, like I said, forty-five days. We shot this movie in forty-five days, which is a very tight schedule to shoot a hundred and forty-nine page script. Wow. So people came in and were so professional. They just killed it. It was like watching them do Shakespeare. It was amazing. So for me, as an actor, I just kind of laughed because I was like, I can't do that. It's like I couldn't do what these people are doing, honestly. So it was just nice to be able to be there because Bob was more than happy to have me, you know, available to the actors if they wanted to talk, you know, if they wanted to talk about the material or talk about the work for the day or, you know, Bob and I went to and from work together every day in the same car. So we would sit there in the back and just kind of talk about, you know, the day or talk about, you know, the week, like what work was coming up. And it was, it was a rare and kind of magical experience for me. It felt a bit like a fever dream because writing the script for 10 years was just this weird process. And then to make the movie in this really intense, like, you know, hard schedule was, was, was crazy. It was awesome. Yeah. You know, and also what I, um, enjoy about the film particularly is um, I was explaining this to Kelly Riley when we spoke to her last week um, it's extremely visceral there are parts of it that are just like a gut punch um, emotionally like for instance you know when um, when Whip's telling Tamara Tuni's character to say something to her son in the black box so that kind of thing really really got to me and it gets to a lot of people obviously watching it when you saw the flight crash sequence obviously for the first time on screen after the editor and the visual effects people and everybody else had had their bit putting it together what was your reaction i mean the same i mean there's moments in the movie that really you know that always kind of read on the page because you know this script was a little bit of that script that people talked about a little bit as much as we tried to keep it you know under wraps occasionally it would slip out because we would have actors kind of reading it and you know then there'd be agents and the assistants are always so you know, eager to kind of be in the know. So the script had a little bit of a following. So, and, and because I wrote it over 10 years, it's like the detail in the script, it was like, it was like a serial killer's kind of detail about stuff. It's like I over-described everything. I mean, there's, there's many, there's so much description that's overwritten, but it's because I had all this time to comb through it and comb through it. So that sequence in the first 40 pages, the sequence on the plane, everything was so specific and so researched that by the time I got um, that we got to Atlanta and we were dealing with real technical advisors, they just assumed I was a pilot a lot of them. They just were like, so you fly? I said, no, I'm terrified to fly. I said, are you kidding me? I would never pilot a plane. And they're like, wow, but you really did great with some of this detail. And, you know, they obviously helped a little bit with some more of the, the jargon, you know, more of the tech talk as far as, you know, when they're actually taking off and stuff. But, like, that moment in particular with Tamara Tooney's character, you know, and he says, you know, tell Trevor – you know, you love him kind of thing. Like, that always kind of popped off the page for people. So to see that the two actors, like, really, really brought it home on screen was kind of great, you know, really amazing to watch. Yeah, total great moment in the film. Um, you know, after the plane crash, though, it, um, Kelly, she explained it, uh, it's a, it was a really good way of opening you up for the film because the film moves on from that. Obviously, it's about substance abuse, addiction, a few other things that we won't go into too much detail to spoil it for people. But on the substance abuse and addiction angle, um, obviously, you're drawing from personal experience and you're drawing from people that you know because it touches everybody's life. What yeah. can you tell us about that aspect of the film? I mean, you know, so for me, I'm 44 years old now and it's funny. I always say, like, when I started writing this movie – I didn't have any kids. It's like now I've got three kids and they're like big. They're like on the planet kind of thing. It's so funny. It's like, you know, so it's this movie's kind of the framework of my life. Uh, you know, it's the framework of my career, obviously, because it's been so expansive of these many years. But, you know, the subject matter for me is personal in that, you know, I got sober when I was 25. So, 
that experience, when I started writing the movie, I was probably 31 or so. So I had had six years of, you know, a new pair of glasses, so to speak. So for me, everything in my life was a little bit filtered through kind of that life change that I made when I was 25. So I have my own personal inroad to it and, and the whole idea of like, you know, what that change in your life kind of means for you when it comes to relationships or repairing relationships that you damaged and it's something that the character has to go through. It's like you see kind of the wreckage of this guy's past and, you know, it's it, it's something that just kind of is a weight that he has to carry around, which I think Denzel did in such an amazing, amazing way. So obviously that also kind of like sparked all the the questions in the movie about you know, faith and belief and God and, you know, what, what do we all believe and, you know, fate. Um, so all those things kind of like in life and death and all those things kind of somewhat woven together, you know, inside this bigger incident that happens. Because a lot of times in our daily lives, you know, we don't really, thankfully, have to think about what do we really believe. It's only when something incredibly tragic happens, whether it's a tsunami or, you know, a hurricane in New York that takes people's lives and destroys property. It's like those are the moments where we have, we stop and we, you know, try to be grateful, but we also think like, my gosh, what do I think? Why do I think this happened? And, you know, when we can't explain things, that's when we start, you know, I've said a few times that we've heard that expression, you know, there's no atheists in a foxhole. I don't know if you've ever heard that expression. Uh -huh. yes. Well, I've said, look, I don't think there's any atheist in an airplane at 30,000 feet that starts pitching all over the place because everyone gets real quiet. And I always think, I think they're thinking what I'm thinking, which is, oh, God, please just put us on the ground safely. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's yeah, like, do you believe in God? It's like, I don't know if I believe in God. We'll worry about that later. <laughs> Let's just get there, you know? It's so. true. And that's why people applaud and they get all excited when the plane comes down. It's um, yeah. it's quite an amazing experience. You're in a metal tube in the middle of the sky. Like obviously, there's got to be something. There's got to be a higher power to get you on the floor eventually. I hope. Yeah, and and also add to that the fact that you're going 600 miles an hour in that metal tube. You know what I mean? And you're seven miles above the Earth. Yeah. It's like to me, the physics still doesn't add up, but you know. Yeah, it kind of freaks me out. But anyway, that's another story. Um, yeah. you know, the one thing that I. Um, took away from this film, being a parent myself, is the father-son dynamic, and um, yeah. I found that really pretty touching. Uh, what can you tell us about that angle of the film, and whether you drew from um, life experience? Well, you know, it's tough. It's it's funny. It's the the way I think that I first encountered Steven Spielberg was, you know, I tend to always write these broken father-son stories, you know, and even Dreamer, the movie that I wrote and directed, started as three three men in a in a in a in a family. Um, and I changed it to a girl because of Dakota Fanning, honestly. Um, but I, I think that those origin stories kind of resonate for everybody. You know, it's like the the most the primary relationships we have in our lives with our parents are, I think, so formative and so important, and and so kind of shape who we are. That I'm constantly looking at them and re-examining them. And you know, uh, Spielberg and I had this really interesting conversation about War of the Worlds and Dreamer because we had made the movies at the same time and Dakota's in both movies so we kind of got to know each other a little bit and it was his studio and you know that made my movie too and um, I said well you know um, I said we started talking about the American um, the immigrant story and he said everybody's story in America is an immigrant story and because we started talking about my parents and his parents and my parents you know I'm hundred percent Irish all four of my grandparents were born and lived in Ireland, so it's like we're not. My family doesn't have a big, long, extended, you know, uh, uh, American. You know, it's like we we didn't get we didn't come on the Mayflower. So I mean, you know, so for us, it's like you know those relationships and and you know my relatives that are here and also my relative. It's it's a cultural thing, and, and I think that you know it's the thing that people really connect to in the movie when they see. He's trying at least to make an attempt to repair this relationship with his son that he's obviously just kind of drank away. I don't know. It's hard for people too. It's it's the it's the point of the movie. Most people people hang around after Q and A's and they come and find me and they say, "Man, I I really need to talk to you about my dad or you know my uncle or this relationship." You know, because like you said at the outset, you know, addiction and alcoholism kind of destroys families, man, and everybody everyone's been kind of affected in some way or another. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty true, and um, and that's you know that people are taking that away from the film after such a 
I mean, it's a really scary plane crash and it took me yeah. a little while to get over that. And then the, the film just becomes something else and really does open you up into things that um, you probably don't have much of an opportunity to think about um, when you're watching a film like this. But anyway, um, John, thank you so much for your time and good luck for the awards season coming up. You've got a big roller coaster ride ahead of you. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thank you so much.